Topbed Talk. So Monty Mythen, Anesthesia Critical Care, University College London, and Chairman of the Board of Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine. I've been asked to step in at relatively short notice to chair this session um, because I think they were looking for a completely impartial chair and uh, they couldn't find one. Um, <laughs> so this is going to be discussing troponin screening. Now, troponin has attracted a lot of attention, particularly in the context of something called MINS, myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery. So we're going to be discussing troponin screening, essential or emperor's new clothes. And we're going to hear from Deminda Widjesundera, Mike Grocott and Denny Levitt. And you've met all of those folks before. So in the interest of time, we're going to crack on. Uh, so, Denny, if I can come to you first, just to tell us what, what you do at work on a regular basis... And I'll ask you about your opinion about the Emperor's new clothes or not. So um, I'm a perioperative physician and an intensivist, and I lead uh, our perioperative medicine service and the preoperative or perioperative cardiopulmonary exercise testing service and uh, also work with our prehab group. And then I lead the surgical postoperative critical care unit. So I look after patients after major surgery. Uh, before and after major surgery, and involved in risk stratification. Do you go out to the floor, the ward, to see them as well? Do you have an outreach team and get called out? Yes, we see them. Um, so preoperatively, in, in terms of high-risk clinics, and for emergency patients on the ward, uh, we go and see them. And for patients who have left the critical care unit and are failing uh, on the ward, we also go and intervene to try and identify why. So that, that's the lens through which you're looking at yeah. this. Okay, and... Um, I'll just ask the other two gentlemen as well to give us a quick thumbnail sketch. Deminda, what do you, what's your lens? I mean, so I, I practice uh, until recently uh, cardiac anesthesia, transplant anesthesia, anesthesia for uh, major non-cardiac surgery, and I do a lot of uh, pre- preoperative assessment work as well. Do, do you see patients on the floor afterwards or SIC? It's not a criticism, yeah, it's just no, getting the so lenses. It's, we look at these things through a different sometimes. So I think pro- not so much from a clinical perspective, but because we've run lots of trials that, as it happened, did a lot of troponin screening and follow-up, and you're actively involved in that perspective. So yes, in that perspective, but uh, not as part of my clinical work. Mike? So now uh, adult general intensive care and uh, post-surgical high care. Yeah, and so the, uh, with, and, with visiting patients on the ward uh, who are sick. And my lens is SICU, but it's a thoracic major surgery, and the major surgery is mainly urological ICU. So, um, so, so from, through my lens, I kind of agree with Mike that what I see coming into the intensive care unit or hanging around on the intensive care unit are I can't breathe very well, my kidneys don't work very well, um, my GI tract isn't working very well, my wound has got some sepsis. Those sort of common things. I don't get... I'm not admitting patients who've had MINS, if you see what I mean, as a kind of thing which is undetectable. Denny, where do you stand on this? Where, where? Well, some are very similar. I think, I think even from the pre-op perspective, I find it difficult that there are tools that are just looking at cardiac risk because I don't really see what, which group of patients are out there who have cardiac risk. And I think alone... The a useful example is actually a, a major surgical patient who uh, was a colorectal patient who um, had colorectal cancer and was being referred for a, a major resection, an anterior resection, and he had a history of ischemic heart disease. So the surgeon um, had, uh, had sent him off just to get a, a sort of follow-up appointment with his cardiologist who had you know, declared, you are low risk, you know, you're going to be fine in your surgery. And actually what the cardiologist meant is I think you're at low risk at this time of an ischemic event because your ischemic heart disease is well controlled and you haven't got angina. Uh, The point that was missed was that he was morbidly obese, functional capacity poor, smoking, um, and COPD as well. And this was the problem. So the patient then turned up in our high-risk clinic because we'd seen him exercise, tested him, and that was all flagged up. And he didn't actually have a diagnosis of COPD. He was one of those people that was smoking, and clearly nobody had diagnosed this yet. It's just, I mean, that's a common thing that you see if you exercise test patients and patients who smoke, that just because they haven't had the spirometry yet doesn't mean to say they haven't got an element of obstructive lung disease. And the patient found it very difficult. When we, he came to a high-risk clinic, he was extremely angry when he arrived because he'd already been told by his cardiologist he was low risk. And this whole sort of single-organ approach, when actually you've got to look at the whole patient and actually... As a clinician, as you said, I extremely rarely see that the cause of patients that are, are failing on the wards or end up having emergency admissions to critical care are largely sepsis and pulmonary 
and anastomotic leak. And I would say infarcts are really rare. And a lot of them, because they get to intensive care, always seem to have a troponin. And, you know, middle-grade troponins are common in sick patients. I would agree with uh, what Mike said. So before I get you back in on this, Deminda, one of the challenges to us who work in surgical intensive care, the pushback is that it would appear that most people who die within 30 days of surgery don't get admitted to intensive care. Right. So we are... The reason to get admitted to intensive care are the things we see commonly. So perhaps that's a self-reinforcing bias. And the uh, PJ Devereux, for example, who I think would be regarded as a perioperative cardiologist, he says, yeah, I, I, I see that that's what you see because that's what you do. But I'm out there seeing this very, very broad sweep of the people who are out on the floor still. And you keep telling us that the vast majority of people who die within 30 days die without getting readmitted to intensive care. So... Where, where are we, Domina? I, so I'm confused. So, you know, so this is a hard argument to actually, because I don't actually disagree with Denny and Mike that much. In some way, I think the quote that you brought up on, on how MINS has been pitched, I think has actually been to the detriment of how you can actually use troponin screening. So I think one component is, you know, we still have a large burden of vascular disease in surgical patients. You know, that's still a very common form of the disease. Patients present with this. Uh, and this is not an either-or kind of phenomena. We would want to detect pulmonary complications and surgical side infections, and frankly, I see that more often in my own practice as well. Uh, but it doesn't mean that because we're interested in that that we don't want to pick up those other things. These myocardial infarctions, if you look for it, still occur in about 3% of patients. It's not 25% of patients or 30%. But these are also conditions for which we actually have proven treatments. So if we want to get people out of hospital and find opportunities to transition them to care, where we have therapies that once they leave hospital can improve their survival, we'd want to apply that, right? Now, that doesn't mean that we should... The problem has been that if it's viewed as we should only focus on this and ignore the other stuff, that I think is problematic. And you don't have a myocardial infarction. I, the interpretation of elevated troponin as a disease state, I think, is the most problematic. I think what it is is an alarm indicator. When you look at patients who are in the ICU, they're all sick, so they're all going to have troponin elevations because with high sensitivity assays, it's a marker of inflammation and just general sickness. But I think where its greatest opportunity is is actually for patients on the ward because generally, even on our services, you would see them when they run into trouble. But sometimes that's already well, be, you've, they've failed at that point, right? So could this help us in identifying patients on the ward who are going to get in trouble? Perhaps. But I'm not saying the troponin elevation is an infarct. It just tells us this is a patient who's sick. It could be sepsis. It could be a bunch of things. And we've seen that even in our trials where patients were progressing down. They're getting short of breath. They were decompensating. And the only first sign that we saw was a change in troponin. And that's kind of what we saw. In an otherwise completely well person. They're sitting there smiling, bag packed, looking forward to go home. Nothing wrong with me, Doc. No. Oh, bad news, your troponin's up. No, because a lot of patients aren't. So those aren't the patients. But it's the ones who are, they're kind of short of breath. They're having difficulty. No, no, no. Th- those are sick but patients. Th- they are, but they're not in the ICU. And they're not the uh, ones necessarily we But work with me for a second. Yeah. Sick patients, yeah. I accept the fact. We, yeah. do, we do a whole raft of tests. Yes. And they're usually up. Yes. They're all up, if you see what I mean. Is there really this person sitting there smiling, lipstick on, bag packed, about to go home? Hang on a second. Before you go, your troponin's up. You know, anecdotally, and this is what I'm talking, you do see, you see patients. So as an example, right? So uh, I'd say we've had patients on the ward where we were doing troponin testing only because they were in a trial and that's what was going on. And they were kind of short of breath. They thought it was basically wheezing or asthma. They were treating that. Okay, so they're now sick. They're sick. Okay. But no, no, I'm looking for the non-sick. I'm looking for the completely well. Exactly. But I think okay. it's the opportunity to identify those patients. That I buy yeah. as a kind of because we're yeah. we they're going to get a whole raft when they go off to the lab. They're getting a whole long list of things anyway. So if it's part of a differential diagnosis, I've got to have, got to have this in a second because I'm still not quite sure what to do about it. If I think they might be as part of my differential diagnosis have a hurting heart that might be affecting their breathing, then that's going to get done by a, a junior doctor before I get anywhere near it. If you think. You would hope so, but in truth, I think the data on our failure to identify complications and allow them to progress, 
I think it shows that we don't do a good job of it, right? So I think that's, so if we're doing a fantastic job, those troponin elevations would be detected and we would admit them and manage them. The other thing I'm a little bit worried about, and it's a personal view as well, is if you have a, what you might have an abnormal heart and you get in the zone of a cardiologist, you're getting a bag of M&Ms for life, if you sort of mean. You're, you're, you're going to be on five drugs that might help you in the future before yeah. you can, you know, you, you're, obviously you should take a statin. Your yeah. blood pressure's up a little bit, have a couple of those. Let's thin your blood for a while and hope it goes well. I mean, that's hard to avoid, isn't it? So, I mean, one of the, yeah, the, the, <laughs> been, one of the questions is, and I'm not quite clear from what you said, is, you know, do we really think that a blood test is, that there are no other signs in terms of early warning signs, respiratory rate, SATs, it may be easier to, to monitor. To, I agree that patients are not monitored sufficiently often, and there's a big step down from critical care to ward where you've got, in the UK, often one nurse to eight patients, and maybe OBS being done two to four hourly, because that's two to four hours of being. But you know, maybe with the advent of continuous monitoring, we may be able to see those early. But what I'm not clear about is do... Is troponin predating this deterioration, which may not be to do with the heart, or is it happening at the same time, and it, are there not other simpler ways of just detecting that as sickness, as you were saying, that we should be able to detect with early warning scores or respiratory rate or something else? I suspect there are, but I just don't think yeah. we have systems that actually do that right now. And so I think if we developed, and that would be great. I think the, s- <laughs> the same folks who are pushing the MINS concept or uh, pushing this idea of automated blood pressure monitoring on the wards and so on, which I'd say is one approach. I'd say it's also a complex approach as well. Like it's not exactly an inexpensive. It's probably a lot more expensive than troponin screening, to be honest. So, uh, could we? Those people who'd like to join in from the floor now, if you, you, you want to get involved in the discussion and express some views, I think Dominic could do a little bit of backup here. Can I, um, can if you I, could get your hand up so we could get the microphone to you, as soon as you have a microphone, I'll call upon you, and we'll get Slido up as well so we can get some questions going. Uh, Denny, I'll come back to you in one second. <laughs> I just want to know, um, we are told by one camp, the Minzers we'll call them, yeah. okay, that, that Minz yeah. is, the, is, is the commonest yeah. post-operative complication that is associated with significant harm and death. Whereas when we do trials, we do not find that. Is this a transatlantic phenomenon? Is it a country-based phenomenon? Does it depend on what, you, what question you wrote down on the grant application? So I'd say, and I say this as a, as a North American, that... To be honest, I think the MINS uh, camp is... Actually, if you go to the States, any outside some of the key proponents, and if you look at major key players on the American Heart Association, they do not buy the MINS concept. So it's actually not... It, it, there's a couple of very strong thought leaders in perioperative medicine that have pushed it. Uh, and I think part of the pro- my own view is that people have conflated a prognostic indicator with a diagnosis. And I think these are two different things. Uh, these are all people if they have high troponins who are all at risk, they may or may not be detected for a variety of reasons, but I think we can all agree. These, these are patients who do badly, uh, but I don't think they have a common set of diseases. So I think a component of cardiovascular is a component of other things as well. But they've conflated that. And just what, there was one thing really coming back to what you were saying about getting into, getting into contact with a cardiologist. But, you know, the, the problem is if the patient's asymptomatic and remains asymptomatic when they've got better recovered from their acute surgical, and we're talking about this long-term health prevention, and, and then you go and screen them with coronary CTs. Now, the predictive utility in asymptomatic patients of coronary CT, you can see a lot of coronary calcification, but there's no randomized controlled trial that I was aware of in the cardiology literature that says on the basis of asymptomatic, no symptoms, because there's a big issue in the States with people going off and having these done, that you should embark immediately on primary prevention or secondary prevention, uh, particularly if they didn't actually have an MI, they just had a troponin rise because they were sick. And, and you know, they're not without side effects, the, the drugs that we're talking on, of, and you know, harmful side effects, but also quality of life side effects. If you speak to some people on statins, it's pretty impeding to your quality of life. Mike, anything to add before we go to the questions which are piling it, up here? It sort of feels to me, like the tr- we're being sold troponin, it's a bit like a CRP. It's, a, it, it, it's being, it, to me, it's an indicator of sickness. So the, there's, a, there's an injured organ, but I suspect if you look at other organs, there's lots of injured organs because there's general information going on. But the specific, it, it says, injured heart, worry about the heart, go and do lots of heart things. I'm not, I'm not convinced that that's true, not least based on the, the, the data, Nick Curzon's data from Southampton, that huge numbers of patients in hospital have elevated troponins who seem to happily go home. 
Right, we're going to open it up to Slido, and if anyone wants to join in uh, to express an opinion, please do wave at the two microphone holders and we will get you involved in the whole thing. Uh, voted up to the top is, there is emerging evidence in cardiology about chronic raised troponin. Do you think there is a place for troponin preoperatively for risk stratification? And other, we'll bl- bundle in some other cardiac markers with that as well. So, I mean, I'll kind of the first go at that. So, exactly. So, uh, especially with high sensitivity assays, there's, a pers- there's probably, if we sample everybody here, there's going to be a bunch of us who have an elevated troponin of some form, and that's just a resting level. And we know that's a bad prognostic indicator, period. And in, and that's been shown in at least two, a year, large European study as well as a large uh, U.S. study that a pre-op elevated high sensitivity assay troponin is a predictor of increased mortality after surgery. So that's one reason to do it. The other reason to do it is that, especially with high sensitivity assays, if you don't have a baseline, you may not be able to interpret what a postoperative value is because it may be raised postoperatively, but it may simply be a reflection of the chronic state, or it could be an increase above the baseline state. So you need a reference value. That would be the other reason to do that. So um, the more compelling stories I've heard about how these tests might be used, and I'll bundle in with that pro-BNP, for example, is if you do a, a, a history-based risk evaluation and then you risk stratify somebody, you do a baseline high sensitivity troponin and pro-BNP, you now have tracking mechanisms and, and improved risk uh, ca- characterization to track their risk of, heart, of myocardial events, and maybe all events. Is that, is that sort of how you use it? So I, I, you're asking, yeah. So I think in general the the role it's better established for BNP. So um, that it is a very very good screen out test. So if you have a patient who's very high risk based on clinical history and so on, and you do a BNP and it's low, you should be abs- from a cardiac perspective, their risk of cardiac events is very 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 low. If you combine that with a troponin, it is a fantastic screen out test. If they're elevated then I think it's more uncertain. You know they're at risk, but does it mean if it's because of heart failure, atrial fibrillation, ischemic heart disease? You can't really tell. So if you want to figure out the basis for that, there's still a need for diagnostic workup if you feel that's warranted. But I think in terms of cardiac investigations before surgery, which is still a large focus, certainly in the North American setting, uh, those biomarkers would probably allow us to be more selective in the use of testing than we are currently. I mean, I- I, mean, I would say I, th- I think you can achieve the same with something you know uh, Ramani shared with us the uh, epic data this morning. You can I think you can achieve the same with something like sort, but we don't. So so the uh, from a process point of view, doing a test like this in order to highlight risk, just in order to get people to focus, might be useful. But I'm not sure. It, again, I'm not sure it's all about the heart. And also by the yes, I want to know what it is at baseline in order to know what it is after surgery. Except that I'm not really sure I really want to know what it is after surgery. <laughs> Could I just ask us for a minute for, for the UK audience in, say, if someone's presenting routinely for, uh, I don't know, major colorectal resection, yep. Yep. what would be your routine investigations? And you were saying it, it allows you to, to uh, fine-tune what you do, but what would you do in someone who's got a history of ischemic heart disease? Say, isn't so I, I think in those cases, to be honest, and I think this is where it's very, very challenging because we do far less and less non-invasive stress testing, in part because... None of the interventions have worked, aside from beta blockers. They prevent MI and they kill people. Uh, so I think in, in general, I'd say when somebody has ischemic heart disease, t- to be honest, we, do far, we don't do BMPs and troponins very much because w- it would not modify our management. Mm-hmm. Now, we may test them postoperatively, be- and we've done this in trials because we figured out that a patient who suddenly progresses sh- with shortness of breath you know, on, on day two, and it's probably heart failure from, from ischemia, we already were worried about them because it had bumped the day before, and they were asymptomatic at that time because right. there was a bunch of other things going on. Uh, so in those cases, they've allowed us to target postoperative monitoring, but to be honest, we don't use it as much pre-op when we know the diagnosis. But we've had patients, and I've, I've seen this myself, where they're very, they don't do much in terms of exercise, they have a bunch of vascular risk factors, you're not sure whether you should send them for testing because they have a bunch of reasons why they may have undiagnosed coronary disease. If I do a BNP and the value is low, we just, mm-hmm. just send them on to surgery and forget about it. It's difficult when it's raised because now you have to figure out whether it's worth doing anything further. But it does modify whether we put invasive lines in and monitor them in a different way postoperatively. So we're going to do quick-fire questions now. So if someone knows the answer, please give it. If someone disagrees from the panel, you can butt in. What should one actually do practically with an asymptomatic post-op raised 
Patient with raised troponin, do an angiogram, anticoagulation, post-surgery. I mean, you go first. What practically can, can we do? So, so if, I mean, we, we might use it, but if we found one, uh, uh, I mean, I'd do an ECG, take a history exam and all, all those kind of things. I, I wouldn't be pushing them towards a cardiologist in a hurry. So, so, you know, so I, I'd agree with Mike. We do those things, make sure they're stable. We're not missing anything. What it does suggest, though, is that... But so, practically you do practical. nothing. Why did you measure it? So I think, so it's one of the reasons why we actually, at our center, uh, we don't aggressively monitor them because I think we don't have a post-op follow-up system that works. What is happening at a couple of Canadian centers, which I think is a great idea, is an entire idea of a rapid referral clinic for patients post-surgery. Yeah. So when patients come back to see their surgeon about two weeks afterwards, they'd see an internist or a physician at that point and say, you had a troponin elevation, we're not sure why, let's actually figure out if you need a workup. Because we do know that these patients have worse outcomes for a bunch of reasons, even if they're stable. Like, and this is work Scott Beatty showed using the Enigma 2 trial data, that even if it was... A, even if you're, out, if, you're troponin, if you're asymptomatic, your one-year survival was way worse with a troponin elevation. So is there anything modifiable about that? Well, there's an opportunity to work it up, but it doesn't have to occur during would it, hospitalization. Would it be enough just to tell the patient it happened and to tell them what that means? Or? I, so I think if we do that, you would generally say that you have had a blood test elevation. There's nothing acutely concerning, but we need to see you back to figure out if there's any conditions that would require further workup. And that, that's really what they need. It doesn't have to occur during the hospitalization, which is, I think, the biggest impediment to how this has been managed. Is secondary prevention effective after perioperative type 2 MI versus de novo ACS in non-surgical patients? You know, I, I'm not a cardiologist, but I'd say... So I don't know a clear answer to that, but I think if you've got pre-existing coronary disease, if you've got atherosclerotic disease that resulted in a type 2 myocardial infarction, there's no reason why you should not want treatments that would prevent progression of heart failure in those patients or progression of vascular disease. I mean, that, if you have atherosclerotic disease, you should get that. You should still have appropriate treatment. But we're, we're extrapolating, I presume. Yeah. I think we're we agreeing the, we don't know the answer to that question. Most, I don't know the answer, and most of the trials are done on type 1 MIs because that's where the research has been. Danny, you've looked closely at this literature. Do we know the answer to that question? No, we don't know the answer. There's no evidence on which to, to base doing it, I think it's fair to say. So there, is, there hasn't been a good study to ask that question, but the moment all the evidence for uh, secondary prevention is based on type 1 MI. So you are in an evidence-free zone with drugs that might cause harm. So, Richard, thank you. I think we've covered that off. Is that fair? Most secondary prevention strategies are aimed at type 1, not at not type 2. Uh, anything to add to that? No. OK. What about doing a troponin about eight hours post-CPET, which has been discussed, you know, to do it around the time? Has, hasn't some of that been done as a potential prognostic or giant can of worms? You just stress them hard. Do a troponin. <laughs> so I, I don't know. The, so very interesting. Probably currently a giant can of worms. Uh, I mean, certainly you can. Uh, we've done some before and immediately after CPET measurements, uh, and and you see some. That there is variability in the degree to which people's antioxidant systems are activated, their inflammatory systems are activated, and, and organ injury markers, but I don't think we fully understand what that means at the moment. Because if your ST segment shift, you get referred. Uh, you've just had a stress, an induced myocardial ischemia. Is that correct? On a CPAP? It depends on the clinical context. Okay. Because one of the reasons why uh, excise stress testing is no longer used as the primary diagnostic tool for diagnosing ischemia in patients with heart disease is it has limited positive and negative predictive value. So that's a problem. There's a high false positive rate, particularly in asymptomatic people, particularly in women, middle-aged. So if you have just some ST changes at the end of exercise at a decent, when the patient's done a huge amount of exercise, that's sort of allowable. And certainly our cardiologists who also CPEP patients for uh, looking at long-term prognosis, are definitely d- disinterested in either seeing those patients if they're asymptomatic or chasing anything further. So it depends. Equally, if they turn their legs and get massive ST depression and then they aren't across the whole chest leads uh, with two mils of ST depression, it would be slightly different. But we don't... In that situation, and if it resolves, we don't do a troponin routinely. So Joanna Coates, another question from Joanna. Thank you very much indeed. Can we have a show of hands in the audience? If you were to have surgery and then a raised troponin without symptoms, would you want more drugs and tests? Now, we're a highly informed audience, so we can probably interpret these tests if they're shared with us. So um, I'm going to ask it in two stages. 
If you had a raised troponin postoperatively, this audience here, hands up if you'd like to know. Okay. If you'd like to know. Which I think is the majority. Just a tip to make sure everyone's understanding the question. Can you put your hand up if you wouldn't like to know? Okay, we have, we have a couple. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Well done. You're in the right room. Just <laughs> and uh, apologies for that. The, um, uh, and the, the, the question Joanna directly asked is, if that happened, as opposed to just knowing, would you want more drugs and tests? Not drugs. Now, just so I can get a balance on that, because I think that's approaching a third to a half. Can you put your hand up if you wouldn't want any more drugs and tests? Am I fair calling that about, about a split, rough split-ish? So interesting. So we are clearly have equipoise. So you have a remit to do a trial <laughs> on <laughs> clinicians who attend these sorts of meetings in London in July. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a complication which doesn't need specific ICU treatment as much as medical treatment? I think it's referring to the, you know, we look at it the lens of the people who end up back on ICU. Minda? We're talking about myocardial injury? Yeah. So I... I actually don't think it's a compli- you know it is not a complication in the way you think about respiratory failure or sepsis. It is just a constellation of of sickness. It's a marker of sickness for a patient who's either sick already or on their way to get sick. So I think a proportion of them would need ICU treatment, but they're probably the ones who get sick very quickly. But there's a proportion where, you know, I think uh, they may need medical treatment to begin with. Uh, I think it's it, it's it's a very heterogeneous set of conditions. Can we, uh, to, uh, I think it's Tim Miller is going to join in. Brave man with the microphone. Um, so I was very interested in the results of that question. The majority of people would want to know if they had a post-operative raised troponin. I think we had 80% of people in this room. So I'd want we, to know all my results. Though, <laughs> so following on from that, how many people in this room routinely measure troponin post-operatively in high-risk surgical patients? Okay, so these routines, uh, I'm get, it seems to be one, two, three... So we all want to know, but only four of us do it. It's kind well, of interesting. Oh, well, once someone's done it, so don't, anyone does a test on me, I want to know the result of it, because I can't rely on anyone else to look at it. Well, if we want to know the result of it, presumably we want to have the test. Which no, is no, a different question. Uh, uh, different question, <laughs> different question. Okay, hands up, who would like to have, if they're asymptomatic, who would like to have their troponin measured postoperatively? Ah... See, well, we want to know if it's raised. It's if it's been it? measured, it's I want to know the result. I don't, if you've measured my serum rhubarb, I want to know what it was. <laughs> uh, is, that, is that too bad? Right, does Min's... Co- are you right, Tim? Anything else? Yeah. Really? You're up on the stage next. Does, does, that's from Joanna. Uh, Coates, again from New Zealand, does Min's cause hypotension or does hypotension cause Min's? In any case, shouldn't good fluid management, respiratory support, looking after the patient properly, perhaps what happened in the IMPRESS trial, fix it anyway? Is, 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 is an, an elevated means in part just a manifestation of poor care? Probably. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, again, is, that, I is that why more of it's we, happening in certain countries uh, and not in others? I don't Ooh. think we know. I okay. think it's... Uh, I doubt it. it it's a non-specific... I, I think it's... It, well, it's not... It's a, a marker of organ injury that denotes overall malaise, but it doesn't necessarily... Unless we measure other organs and establish that they're not injured... We can't say it's an, it's an isolated cardiac problem, and I'm not sure we understand the significance of it. So, therefore, it probably is worse in hypotension because most organs get pretty unhappy when the blood pressure is not adequate. But I think it's a moment that's a question we don't know the answer to yet. Is that fair? I, I think so. I mean, yeah. really it's a reasonable hypothesis yeah. to pursue. But we so know it's associated, but we don't know whether it's yeah. causal. And there have been some case cohorts where the association is tighter than... And but it's very hard to figure out what the temporal relationship exactly. is, what leads to what. I mean, ultimately, it'd be interesting to see what studies that optimise blood pressure control, what impact they actually have on, on, on myocardial injury and infarction. And I guess the second part of that question, which is, should we, therefore be, shouldn't they all be cared for properly? Yes, undoubtedly, but I think certainly in the UK, if you're on a general ward, the level of staffing, particularly overnight, is so light that it's very difficult to be confident of that. So you, it, it might cause you to change their environment. I love this question. Are there sick patients with normal troponin levels? So if you're overtly crook postoperatively, right. some of those people have... Yeah? So, so I think the answer is yes. Uh, so I think the answer is yes because we do, me- so we do measure troponins right. when we're worried about the heart. Yes. And 
they're sometimes normal in critically ill patients. So do some of your patients who are admitted with pneumonia and AKI have normal troponins, mm. for example? Yes. No, no, hang on, there's a inter- family dispute going on now. <laughs> <laughs> Minding. Hang on a second, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Denny? I think they're speak? often, like, <laughs> what I would say is they're a little bit up most of the time <laughs> they may not be you know because you often actually as you said you usually get but they're not really elevated but they're a bit elevated they're sort of where you go oh, it, you know it's it's because they're sick because it's like j- just above the normal range i don't think you see them plum normal that often so um Dominda from ye uh, <laughs> would you suggest screening to in post-op considering the data you show is mi within 30 days of surgery so, I mean, the 30-day follow-up for this is generally because that's a post-op window, but the majority of infarctions occur within the first 72 hours after surgery. Now, part of it is driven because that's when you screen patients, but, but in general, even when you look at readmissions for infarct, that's when they occur. They don't occur at day 29 or 30, typically. Right, I f- apologise that we're at some excellent questions that we haven't got to yet, um, so please do pick them up outside in the forum. We can even sit you down and do a podcast to get these wonderful people to answer your questions for you. But if we can give them a big round of applause for... Hey, Mitch Harrison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there join us and finally check out topmedtalk.com if you go to our website you can subscribe to email updates that way we can always tell you where we're going to be what we're going to be doing and how you can join us topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M dot org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.